Hello everyone. This is Dr. Khalid Imran. I welcome you all to the seventh session of this lecture series on module five, which is manufacturing uh, uh, systems, your machine tools, and advanced manufacturing systems. So, in the previous session, in the previous class, we had discussed advantages, uh, limitations of uh, a computer numerically controlled machine. Then uh, we had discussed about uh, the different elements of a CNC machine. Uh, you had seen the working of CNC machine, the the various parts, essential features of CNC machine. So after having discussed uh, CNC machines, uh, now let us go on to the next topic, which is robotics. So what basically are robots? A robot is a reprogrammable, multifunctional manipulator. designed to move materials parts tools or specialized devices through variable programmed motions of performance of a variety of tasks or for a variety of for a variety of tasks so robots are basically these are reprogrammable multifunctional manipulator which manipulates the work which manipulates the raw material which orients the raw material and which holds different components parts which holds tools which manipulates tools so that a particular operation is carried out like an operation a turning operation in a lathe or a drilling operation in a drilling machine so all these things can be very easily carried out in a robot but the tasks which are given to robot are, is having variety is diversified so robots can can be reprogrammed it can be programmed and reprogrammed and it is a multifunctional manipulator the same robot can do turning operation the same robot can do drilling operation it can do milling operation it can do painting operation uh, it can do grinding operation there are multiple operations can be performed by one single robot so there is a reason the name it is what it is multifunctional manipulator initially it is reprogrammable every time you give a task to a robot after delivering a particular task the robot can be reprogrammed for a new task so this gives the meaning reprogrammable it is a reprogrammable multifunctional manipulator which can do multifaceted works designed to move what to move the raw material from one location to another location to move semi finished parts or the finished components are parts it is also used to hold tools different types of tools like you know Uh, it can be a single point cutting tool it can be a multi point cutting tool like it can be hss single point cutting tool of a lathe it can be a drill bit it can be a reamer it can be a tap it can be a milling cutter so different tools can be accommodated in a robot how exactly is the robot performing by variable program motions depending upon the program which is fed into the system into a computer system or directly into a robot so uh, speaking about the field of uh, robotics it is defined as a field of technology that deals with the idea generation that is the conception and once the conception uh, is feasible then they go for design and the design should be optimal once the design is optimal then the construction takes place uh, like a prototype is built up based upon the outcome or the results of the prototype a real life model of the robot is manufactured or made once you have the robot then the operation is seen what operations it can perform and finally the applications so robotics is defined as the field of technology that deals with conception that is idea generation then the design optimization then the construction of it operation and application of robots all these things are are like you know it is in series first we have the concept then the design then the construction then the operation and finally the application of robots so what basically are robots and how are their motions characterized like robots possesses anthropomorphic characteristics like human like characteristics human human like physical movements human human like uh, sensory uh, you know uh, inputs for, for example uh, we have a mechanical arm Uh, a robot will be having a manipulator a base so the entire manipulator and base resembles a human arm a human arm like this and which performs 
various tasks and uh, besides uh, having the physical features like in human arm it can also perform many things like it can respond to the sensory inputs like uh, a robot can uh, vision it, it has vision sensor by the help of vision sensor sensors it can visualize things uh, there are proximity sensors wherein it can uh, feel the distance it has uh, temperature sensors so there are different types of uh, sensors which are fixed in a robotic system by the help of which a robot can respond as a human being not exactly as a human being why because it requires higher amount of artificial intelligence when artificial intelligence is more in a robot then it almost uh, performs uh, you know uh, actions same as human beings but there are certain limitations of it there are definitely more advantages than limitations of a robot so as i told you in earlier classes also uh, as we have conventional as we have uh, cnc machines cnc turning center cnc milling center which is part of automation even robots are a part of robotics i can say robotics is the part of automation i told you earlier also we have robots then we have you know machine tools like a lathe which is which is a cnc lathe which can be a cnc milling machine or a drilling machine besides this uh, advanced manufacturing machines or systems we also have agvs automated guided vehicles automated storage and retrieval systems all put together forms for automation so here a robot is one part of automation this is uh, about the history of robotics i don't want to dwell into detail of the history of robotics to start with in 1920s the word robot was coined in 1920 uh, by a novelist uh, carl capic so this person basically uh, the, the literal meaning of robot is servant so this was basically a novel show a stage show wherein he carl capic he depicted the robot as a servant so later on 1957 uh, uh, cyril walter kenward developed a manipulator in 1957 that could move in all three axes x y z axis later on 1961 the unimation uh, uh, company they unveiled a robot in 1961 which was called unimate unimate developed by devil and mulger later sold to general motors gm Once again, 1968, 1966, Stanford Research Institute developed a shaky robot. Down the line, in 1970s, a German company they came out with a robot named Famulus. A company called Kuka they developed a robot called Famulus, which had electromechanical systems. Then, uh, in 1981, a Japanese uh, company, uh, you know, they developed. Uh, a direct drive arm in 1981 further the development uh, led to uh, humanoid first advanced humanoid was developed by the honda company known as asimo in 2003 nasa developed one more robot for which was uh, sent to mars for exploration it was a rover basically in 2003 finally like in 2012 general motors and nasa developed robonaut 2 Uh, so basically we say robonaut robonaut is similar to human being all the physical movements like a human arm it has all the sensory inputs and all that was the type of robot which is developed by nasa in 2012 even in india in 2020 the indian space research organization you know they launched vayomitra which was a, a female humanoid and was capable of doing multiple tasks so this is a brief history of robotics then why do we need robots is the big question here mm-hmm. basically uh, human beings cannot work uh, in hazardous atmospheres in hazardous dangerous environment mm-hmm. where there is more noise and vibration for example if there is a huge power hammer or some forging operation is taking place in a huge forging industry and the quantum of noise and vibration is so high that human beings cannot tolerate it in such situations robots are recommended similarly a uh, deep space exploration deep sea exploration behind the enemy lines uh, these are the places where the human beings cannot go and work comfortably those are known as non conducive environments so environments which are non conducive which were which are very dangerous like a nuclear power plant for example 
in a nuclear power plant human beings cannot go to the core of it and do the work so in those places robots play a vital role wherein you know the human beings are replaced by robots for the betterment of human beings so that human beings are safe from dangerous environments then the amount of repeatability consistency and accuracy in robots is very very high in comparison with human being to human beings human beings basically uh, they are subjected to uh, exhaustion to fatigue so nobody can work continuously from morning 9 to 5 doing the same job suppose we ask a human being to pick and place a particular component from one location to another location continuously even for 2 hours it becomes impossible for him to deliver the task on a continuous basis so it is basically a boring job boredom is created and in fact uh, the job if the, the job is not creative if it is monotonous what happens like you know the, the person who is doing the job he becomes lazy his efficiency comes down even the amount of precision and accuracy with which the job is to be carried out also comes down on the other hand if at all one any task which is having repeatability and more amount of precision and accuracy then the robot will do consistently repeatedly the robot does the same job assume that we we give a particular task to uh, the robot uh, picking and placing a component from one location to another location in that uh, you know in that way like you know the robot will do the job continuously from morning to evening without a break and without getting exhausted that is the beauty of robots when compared to human beings then it has reprogrammability reprogrammability is very very essential in robots like every robot can be reprogrammed to a different task the entire different task can be performed whenever needed for example in shift 1 a robot is performing some turning operation in you know in the shift 2 the same robot can do some milling operation or painting operation on the other hand a human being will be having very fewer skill sets if at all uh, if you ask a employee who is a worker in a particular uh, industry to do variety of tasks in different shifts it is impossible it by why because Uh, any employee or any worker will not be multifaceted in order to develop a particular skill it requires you know weeks months maybe years that being the reason one of the major limitation of human being is reprogrammability but reprogrammability is very much prevalent in robots then the damaged parts are replaceable see for example if it is human beings if at all if there is some injury on account of some accident uh, in the shop floor Uh, what happens is uh, either uh, the person who is injured the worker who is injured he like you know he is on a long leave um, uh, since he has to recover from the um, injury uh, where where in what happens the it is liable to the company basically uh, on the other hand if at all a robot is damaged those parts are easily replaceable within no time in a very short duration of time the parts can be replaced and once again the robot will function and which is not the what is not in the case of human beings human beings require long amount of time why because they need to be emotionally strong to once again come back to work and they should be physically fit to come back to work if there is any injury that is one major limitation uh, in human beings when compared to robots then robots can be integrated with computer integrated manufacturing and other technologies so robots can be integrated with other systems with servers with big computers uh, with other systems of computer aided manufacturing it can be remotely operated there are many advantages of having robots these are the uh, five major advantages why do we need robots so these terms are uh, related to the industrial robots what are the main features of a, a robot you will be having a manipulator there will be various joints and links there are degrees of freedom uh, the discretion by which a robot can move in the given volume in the given volume of work in the space then we have the end effector and base so basically the first and the last part the manipulator and the base these are integral parts in most of the robots so if you happen to see this particular figure this entire thing is the manipulator we have the base and we have the combination of links and joints put together this is a rigid member known as link and this is a joint a joint 
comes in between two links. For example, if this is link zero and this is link one, the uh, the joint uh, the the point uh, or the part which is connecting link O or link zero with link one is known as joint, named as joint one. Similarly, there is one more link two here. After link one, we have link two. So the part which is connecting link one and link two is known as joint two. Similarly, you will be having n number of joints. If one notices here the entire manipulator and base assembly, it is similar to the human arm, having elbows, shoulders. You have a shoulder here, you have an elbow here, and the elbow shoulders are connected with various joints. Similarly, we do have joints in the entire man, the entire your manipulator and base assembly. So this manipulator and base sometimes forms the integral part. Then we have various joints you have seen. We have links. A link can be an input link. This can be output link. Link 0 is considered to be an input link and link 1 is considered to be an output link. All the actions of link 1 depends upon the actions of link 0. Similarly, actions of link 2 depends upon the actions of link 1. The relative motion between link 2 and link 1 depends upon the type of joint which is being incorporated. Like it can be a linear joint, it can be an orthogonal joint, it can be a revolute joint, it can be a cylindrical joint, it can be a translational joint, there are different state joints, there are different types of joints. So depending upon the requirement, depending upon the application, the entire robot is you know integrated with different types of joints and links. So I hope uh, uh, the explanation on joints and link is clear. If you see this, we have the manipulator, the entire assembly is the manipulator. We have the joint, we have the link and degrees of freedom. So there are various degrees of freedom, uh, like uh, degrees of freedom relation is given as uh, DOF in short, it's the acronym for degrees of freedom is equal to M into N minus one. So N are the number of bodies number of bodies in the system, how many links and joints are there in the system. So M is nothing but uh, these are the spatial bodies like uh, three for planar bodies, uh, three for uh, your rotational bodies and all. C is the number of constraints. It is not there in your syllabus but degrees of freedom is given by this equation. Then we have the end effector. End effector is the last part which is available in this assembly. So now this is the entire manipulator assembly. The last part which gets fitted here is known as the end effector. And the end effector is similar to, you know, the fingers of the human arm. You have the wrist, you have the fingers. It is very much similar to the human fingers, wherein these fingers act as grippers. They grip a particular work. The raw material can be gripped in these fingers. A tool can be gripped. Raw material of any shape, size, geometry can be gripped. It can be picked from one point and placed to the other point. Similarly, this end effector can be like, you know, like, like it, can, it can operate as a tool, like a single point cutting tool or a multi point cutting tool, like a drill bit or a milling cutter or whatever. So the end effector we also called as gripper. It will grip the particular workpiece or the part it will fix into the desired location. It manipulates the work as well as tool. So the very objective of having the end effector is to either manipulate the work or manipulate the tool. To orient the tool towards the workpiece so that the machining is completed. Or it may be a spray gun or a welding uh, torch like a gas welding torch. It may be an electrode for arc welding. It can be anything, end effector. Basically, whenever we speak about uh, end effectors, we, they, they are also called as grippers. When we speak of grippers, it can be a mechanical gripper, hydraulic gripper, it can be pneumatic gripper, it can be magnetic gripper, it can be vacuum gripper. We'll discuss those things in later. So I hope the robot uh, um, anatomy is uh, understood by all. Uh, these are the important, you know, basic terms or terminology of a general robot. Then uh, we have the elements of a robotic system. So the manipulator, the end effector, the actuators. What are these actuators? These are the motors. Like you'll be having uh, stepper motors, you'll be having servo motors, we'll be having linear actuators, linear motors. So these are all the actuators which come inside a robot. And we have the transmission elements like pulleys, gears, you will be having sprockets. All these things are you know, power transmitting elements. 
then we have the control system as i told you earlier the control system like a gripper can be a mechanical gripper it can be a hydraulic or a pneumatic gripper then once again a robotic system can be an open loop system or it can be a closed loop system uh, i you know strongly believe that open loop and closed loop uh, control systems are very really, are very clear to you uh, why because i had explained what is open loop and closed loop systems with respect to automation in the previous session in the previous lecture so basically if at all uh, there is feedback system then we call that as open or closed loop system if there is no feedback system we call that as open loop system then we have different types of sensors as i told you besides having the physical characteristics of a human being robots do have different types of uh, sensory inputs it can it can take different sensory inputs so it has different types of sensors like you know proximity sensors touch sensors vision sensors temperature sensors accelerometers so on and so forth then we have a dedicated computer system on which this separate program is developed using a particular software so based uh, based upon the instructions in the program based upon the instructions in the algorithm a robot functions then we have the power source power source are basically you know um, uh, cadmium batteries or it can be uh, lead acid batteries nowadays we have lithium ion batteries these forms the power source for the robot so these are the type of end effector if you see this particular figure end effector here the end effector can be either uh, a mechanical end effector it can be a mechanical gripper you can see end effectors are basically classified into two types one are known as the grippers and the second are known as the tools under grippers once again we have mechanical grippers if you see see this particular adjacent figure these appears to be like you know fingers of a hand at the end of the wrist what you have fingers like thing so these are the you know fingers are jaws i can say in between these jaws are fingers the component is gripped it is you know picked from one particular location placed in some other location so it um, when we, when we say placing the placing mean it can be insertion it can be screwing up so it can perform a variety of tasks it is not just picking and placing things it is also manipulating things orienting the work piece in different directions uh, in in at uh, different locations either you are screwing the part assume that there is some bolt here so this particular end effector it rotates so that the bolt gets screwed inside the nut so it orients the part it orients the part here so we have mechanical grippers it can be pure mechanical grippers but since the efficiency of mechanical grippers is lesser when compared to the hydraulic system uh, we go for hydraulic grippers and then once again we have vacuum grippers vacuum grippers are uh, used to you know lift huge weights for assume that you have a flat surface you have a huge um, uh, metal piece a rectangular metal piece now we you want to lift that metal piece mechanical grippers grippers will not be very effective in the place of mechanical grippers one can have vacuum cups using those vacuum cups the entire body or the work piece can be lifted very comfortably then we have magnetic grippers for the ferrous metals then we have adhesion grippers for lifting uh, textiles especially in textile industries most of the textiles are lifted using adhesion grippers so besides having grippers one can also accommodate tools what are these tools it can be uh, a turning uh, like you know turning operation can can be carried out by using a single point cutting tool like a carbide insert so a tool holder can be a tool then we have a spot welding gun a spot welding gun will act as a tool a spray painting gun will act as a tool a drill bit will act as a tool a drill chuck along with the drill bit will act as a tool Uh, you have the arbor and the milling cutter assembly that will act as a tool so tools can can be anything it can be a milling tool it can be a drilling tool it can be a turning tool it can be a single point cutting tool it can be a multi point cutting tool so these are the types of end effectors there are two types of end effectors classified as grippers and tools i hope this is clear now these are different types of you know before discussing your uh, robot configuration we have different types of configurations like polar configuration cylindrical configuration cartesian configuration and all before discussing all those configuration it is absolutely essential for you to understand different types of robot joints so these are a variety of robot joints there are five different types of robot joints rotational joint or r joint 
linear joint or L joint, orthogonal joint or O joint, twisting joint or T joint, or finally we have revolving joint or V joint. If you see this figure, you can understand rotational joint or R joint is this one, wherein we have an input link, you have an output link. So like you know, the motion or the movement of the outlet output link depends upon the movement of the input link. That is one thing, number one. Number two is the axis of joint one or it is the axis of link one, input link one and output link, output link, both the axis, it can be collinear or it can be perpendicular to each other so that the output link oscillates about the input link with respect to this joint. So this types of joints are known as rotational joint and uh, the notation for that is R joint. Similarly, we have linear joint or L joint when there is where there is translational movement, a linear movement between input link and output link. You can see this, the output link axis and the input link axis are aligned here. So that the action of output link definitely depends upon the action of input link. Besides, the output link can move in a linear direction and this is denoted by L joint. Then we have orthogonal joint or O joint. Now this is the input link, this is the output link. Here the axis of the output link is perpendicular to the axis of the input link. Thereby this output link can slide over the input link. And this type of joint is known as orthogonal joint and is denoted by O joint. Then we have twisting joint. You can see this. This is stationary and this is twisting about this axis. You can see the output link is getting twisted. Similarly, this can be stationary and this can rotate about the same axis. Sometimes both input link as well as output link rotates in opposite direction. And this type of joint is known as twisting joint, also known as T joint. Then we have the last joint known as the revolving joint or a V joint. You can see the input link, uh, input link axis and the output link axis are perpendicular to each other so that the output link can rotate about the axis of input link, right? This is known as the revolving joint and the notation is V joint. So based upon this joints, we have different types of configurations. So these are common robot configurations. We have polar configuration. The alternate name for polar configuration is spherical configuration. Then we have cylindrical configuration, Cartesian coordinate system, nothing but Cartesian configuration and jointed arm configurations. These are the fundamental types of configurations and based upon these configuration, different types of robots across the globe are manufactured. So coming to the very first one, the polar configuration, you can see the base. It is having a round base. It has a body and it has this particular member, a translational member, we call this an arm. So the arm moves to and fro. It goes inside the body in a linear direction. And this is the end effector. The end effector is having one more twisting movement. You can see this one more rotational movement, I can say. So here we have the entire body, the thing with this is the body of it, the entire body and the entire arm can be swiveled about 360 degrees with respect to the base. And it is having a rotational joint. You can see here, this base and this body is pivoted, means it is fixed about this point so that it can oscillate about this, this axis. It can rotate about this axis for certain degrees, not uh, a higher, not higher degrees are achieved here. One of the major uh, limitation here is the vertical reach. Why? Because the height of the robot is limited. Being the reason, being like you know, since the height is limited here, the vertical reach in this type of polar configuration is a limitation. It can have good horizontal reach. It can rotate about 360 degrees and it, it can you know pick and place the parts from one point to another. It can perform various operation like forging operation and die casting operation. It can perform injection molding, dip coating that is dip coating is nothing but painting operation comfortably. But the major limitation of this type of configuration is the vertical reach. So Unimate 2000 series robot is built upon polar configuration. I hope this is clear. The next type of configuration is your cylindrical configuration. 
in order to overcome the limitation in the polar configuration which was the vertical reach the height of the polar configuration rope is limited so we have limited vertical reach in order to overcome this we have cylindrical configuration so in cylindrical configuration we have a column which is having a bigger height which is lengthy and about this column the entire body can move about 360 degrees you can see here it is having a twisting joint so the entire body can move around this column not only rotate about this column it can also slide over the length of the column thereby the drawback which was there in the previous model in the previous uh, configuration which is your polar configuration is taken care of here in this type of configuration the vertical reaches the vertical the vertical reach here is obtained or achieved now we have a arm which uh, moves inside the body here and this is an orthogonal joint then once again we have rotational joints here the manipulator can move rotate either in this direction or in this direction also so there are various degrees of freedom 1 2 3 4 5 1 2 3 4 5 there are five degrees of freedom means five movements in different axes in different planes can be accomplished using the cylindrical configuration so this is a general motor fed uh, corporation uh, uh, robot it is known as model 1a and uh, there are different applications uh, are you know functions of this robot it can perform foundry and forging operations it can uh, you know also perform piloting uh, operation then machine loading and unloading you have the raw material the robot picks the part from the raw material section and fits inside the machine tool that is one simple operation which can be performed by cylindrical configuration here you can see the work envelope is cylindrical why because it is rotating in this fashion so the entire work envelope is basically cylindrical in nature right pallet transfer is something you are picking the parts and placing on a conveyor belt we say palletizing depalletizing palletizing is once again an operation wherein a particular part is taken from one location and placed to some other location then once again for example uh, we say stacking operation you have cotton boxes cotton boxes are taken from one location and placed at some other location the next cotton box is taken from the same location and placed next to the cotton box which was previously placed so the robot has to calculate the place of origin where the part is picked up and the place where it is uh, where the part is placed like you know the, the both the places are not at the same location uh, like you know the, the the part which is being picked may differ in its locations or may not differ in its locations if it differs in its locations then the robot has to perfectly calculate the location between the you know the input location and the output location means where exactly the part is being picked and where it is being placed so it it needs to calculate based upon uh, the coordinate system so this is all about your cylindrical configuration then we have cartesian coordinate system now this particular robot has a rectangular space i can say it complete rectangular uh, space or we say a rectangular envelope in which the robot arms operate there are no rotational movements here there are no cylindrical or symmetric parts here that being the reason uh, this type of robot is also known as cartesian coordinate systems as the robots only move in either x or y and z direction simultaneously not just x and then y and then z all x y z movements are accomplished here simultaneously this is a very sturdy robot very robust robot compared to the previous versions be it your cylindrical configuration or your polar configuration the two configurations in comparison to polar configuration and cylindrical configuration the cartesian coordinate system is more robust that being the reason heavy loads can be comfortably lifted by cartesian coordinate systems you can see here uh, your material handling loading and unloading the machining operations for all the machining operations assume that the part is uh, somewhere around uh, 30 kg 40 kg 50 kg 100 kg where human beings cannot do this job that being the reason human beings are replaced by robots in places 
where the task is to lift heavy weights like pick and place tasks. So this robot is exclusively used for picking and placing the raw material or the tools or anything from one point to another point. So International Business Missions IBM 7565 is a robot which is built upon this type of configuration Cartesian coordinate systems and this has a rectangular envelope completely rectangular work envelope. So I hope you have understood this configuration. The last type of robot here is the jointed arm configuration. This jointed arm configuration is a very complicated robot. It's a very expensive robot, complicated robot. Why? Because it is, it totally resembles, you can see, it totally resembles a human arm. Having elbows, you have uh, arms, elbows. The entire human arm here will be having a shoulder, you will be having elbows, you will be having various joints. In this type of jointed arm configurations, all the three limitations see the limitations in the limitation in this is uh, uh, you are rotational movement we don't have any rotational movement a cylindrical configuration is not uh, very much robust as the height increases the instability is more and here we have height as the limitations so all uh, all the limitations in the previous configurations in the polar configuration in the cylindrical configuration and in the cartesian configuration is taken care in case of a jointed arm configuration this has both the horizontal reach as well as vertical reach assume that the length of this links are increased then both the horizontal links as well as the vertical link uh, the horizontal reach and the vertical reach both increases both increases so the entire links can rotate about 360 degrees you can see here it can revolve about any degree and all the joints are rotational in nature there are uh, no linear joints basically but all are rotational joints but the vertical reach is very high the horizontal reach or grip is very very high thereby this configuration any robot built on this configuration is a very expensive robot the Cincinnati Melicron 73776 robot is built upon the jointed arm configuration and it is used for very uh, precision work like arc welding then we have spot welding then we have spray painting all the cars for example the automobiles are painted in uh, a huge industries using your jointed arm configuration robotic system i hope all the configurations are clear to know you know what are the limitations what are the advantages and what are the applications of every configurations the applications which are mentioned in these slides are very limited but we have wide variety of applications of all these configurations so things will be more clearer if at all you watch the video this you just you know watch this video there are four main types of robotic arm geometry rectangular cylindrical spherical and jointed spherical robots with rectangular arm geometry use Cartesian coordinates and move linearly along each of the X, Y, and Z axes. This type of movement is also called 3P geometry, where the P stands for prismatic or linear motion. This type of geometry is most commonly used with pick and place or large overhead mounted robots. Rectangular arm geometry robots can only move linearly in each direction and so this is a rectangular arm geometry wherein you can see it is extensively used for pick and place applications picking commodities from one location and placing at the other location so it is your rectangular you know uh, robotic configuration Cartesian uh, configuration yeah. overhead crane robot is a good example of this type of motion it can move forward and backward, left and right, and up and down. Robotic arms that use Cartesian coordinate geometry generate a rectangular work envelope. Rectangular robotic arms have the simplest geometry and control system and are typically used in material handling operations. Cylindrical arm geometry robots move linearly in two directions. 
and rotate in one other. Since this type of robotic arm moves in two separate prismatic or linear directions and rotates in one direction, it's given the designation of R2P, where the R stands for rotational. This type of robotic arm is most often used in machine tending, assembly, material handling, and palletizing operations. Robotic arms with cylindrical geometry move linearly in two directions. Vertical linear motion is called stroke. Horizontal linear motion is called reach. And rotational motion is called swing. Swing and reach. Cylindrical geometry robots have a cylindrical work envelope. The advantages of this type of work envelope is a robotic arm reach that is deep at both the top and bottom of the stroke. Vertical reach. Additionally, the robot structure allows for quick movements with high repeatability, a smaller use of floor space, and a larger payload capacity due to structural rigidity. Spherical arm geometry robots can rotate in two directions and move linearly in one and thus are given the designation of 2RP. The robot has base rotation, shoulder geometry. rotation, and prismatic or linear motion at the arm. This type of robotic arm is most often used in machine tending, material handling, welding, painting, robot. coating, and assembly tasks. So be it there the, are four main types of robotic arm geometry. Oh. Rectangular, cylindrical, spherical, and jointed spherical. Yeah. Robots. So that's all about uh, 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 the different configurations of robot. I hope all the four configurations, be it your polar configuration, or uh, be it your jointed arm configuration, be it uh, uh, your cylindrical configuration, all the configurations are very much clear to you. Coming to the applications of robots, so there are n number of applications of robots. It can be material handling, it can be uh, material handling, it can be assembly, it can be under material handling itself. Uh, we have different options here. It can be transfer of materials, it can be machine loading and unloading purposes, it can be for processing operations, it can be for assembly and inspection. So under uh, transferring of materials, it can be pick and place applications. You are picking a particular part, a component of a machine, uh, an automotive component or an aerospace component from one location and placing it to another location. Pick and place application is the most common type of application across all the configurations. Almost every robot can perform the simplest task of picking and placing the components or parts or the raw material from one place to another place. Palletizing application is nothing but picking a carton box for example from one location and placing to a new location. Every time it picks a part or a carton box having some commodity inside from one location and it is placing to a new location like one box. First, uh, first, first box is being lifted from the origin to destination one location. The next box from the origin on the uh, previously placed box. Similarly, it is stacking the parts, stacking or you know, palletizing the parts one above the other. We also call it a stacking op application, but stacking is a bit different from palletizing. When we speak about palletizing application, palletizing application is placing a particular part from the origin and placing it to a new location every time that is palletizing application. Depalletizing is removing from one place and placing to the original position. Then stacking application is play, placing parts one above the other is stacking application. Insertion application is inserting a component for example one wants to fit the chuck on the spindle of a headstock then it, uh, the entire chuck is being what uh, screwed on to the spindle that is one insertion application or inserting a bolt inside a nut screwing the bolt inside the nut that is also you know insertion application 
or inserting a stud inside a cavity that is also insertion applications so many insertion applications can be performed wherein it is not possible for human beings to do the same job assume that you have a huge uh, power uh, screw you have a huge power screw having a weight of 100 kg or 200 kg a human being cannot do the same so in place of a human being the robot takes the 200 uh, kg of your uh, uh, screw rod and it screws inside the nut that is one insertion application so all this application be it your pick and place wherein huge weights are to be lifted which, uh, which is not possible by human beings robot does the work palletizing deep palletizing and this job is done be it picking and placing be it palletizing deep palletizing stacking or insertion applications this applications or operations can be carried out continuously from morning to evening without a break which is impossible in case of a human being then machine loading and unloading so we have die casting you know cord is casting basically i had discussed casting casting is getting a casted part by pouring the hot molten metal inside the mold or the cavity uh, upon solidification you know once uh, 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 time is given for solidification you get a casted part from the mold or the cavity that is die casting die, you have a die and the molten metal is poured inside the die we have die casting we have forging forging is hammering a part Uh, in the red hot condition to deform it to give a shape and size to give to give a proper shape and size to the particular raw material that is forging operation so whenever the parts are very huge very hot and even die casting is what you are uh, trying to uh, lift a ladle ladle is a bucket which comprises of molten metal so you know holding a bucket having molten metal is uh, not a joke human beings cannot do it so in those places where human beings cannot work comfortably which are non conducive like die casting and forging robots play a vital role then we have plastic injection molding then sheet metal operations and different manufacturing processes they use robots and then we have heat treatment process see fundamentally heat treatment is an operation to change the physical mechanical chemical metallurgical properties of different uh, components made up of different metals they heat a particular component for example you have a shaft which is a power transmitting uh, element you can say or your power transmitting element such as gears pulleys are mounted on a solid rod on a shaft i want the shaft to be strong and hard so i want to increase hardness toughness of that particular shaft then we go for a heat treatment process so there are different types of heat treatment processes like you know annealing normalizing quenching different types of uh, you know Uh, processes are there uh, which comes under heat treatment and when we say heat treatment we use furnaces we use huge oil baths heated oil baths heated brine solution and you know when, when the when the temperatures are very very high which are not conducive to which are not conducive to human beings in those places heat treatment operations can be conveniently carried out using robots that is material handling once again then all your processing operations like spot welding operation we have arc welding operation spray coating operation these are all operations which are hazardous spray coating is nothing but the paint coating arc welding once again whenever arc welding is carried out it gives poisonous gases or smoke which is harmful to human beings so human beings can be replaced by robots to carry out be it spot welding operation arc welding operation spray coating or operation etc assembly and inspection also forms an important role assembly it can be assembly of a machine tool it can be assembly of a automobile it can be any assembly wherein like you know in in a conventional assembly uh, basically will be having various stations we say work stations so at those work stations or stations uh, usually human beings you know employees or the workers will stand at different points and they will try to assemble parts if the assembly is simple it is fine human beings can do it on the other hand if the assembly comprises of very heavy parts and more number of parts a human being cannot perform the assembly operations in those places like you will be having parts moving on a conveyor belt the robotic arm it picks up the part and it fits the part in the desired location very conveniently that is assembly operation inspection is also a tedious you know monotonous job Uh, wherein uh, if done continuously for many hours then the efficiency 
of the person doing the inspection or measuring a particular parameter using some uh, metrological instrument comes down that being the reason inspection can also be carried out using robots so these are the advantages of uh, industrial robots robots can be substituted for humans to work in hazardous work environment you know that wherever the work environment is non conducive as i had discussed earlier be it your deep space exploration behind the enemy lines be it a nuclear reactor or underwater exploration those places human beings cannot work continuously as together so which are hazardous to the human beings so those places human beings are replaced by robots so robots can work at constant speeds without any break so which is not possible by human beings robots are capable of lifting very heavy loads without getting tired or injured or getting exhausted robots can work in very tight spaces where human beings reach is not possible very confined small places where human arm cannot reach we can make the robotic arm to reach that particular place so the usage of robot produces lesser or no defective parts since everything is automated you have a robot in place you have a advanced machine tool like a cnc machine in place we have automated guided vehicle in place when we have all these automated systems in place the number of defective parts will dramatically will drastically come down as a result time is saved when time is saved money is saved for the organization so the number of accidents in the workplace are very lesser very fewer right why because uh, the riskier jobs uh, can be performed by robots and uh, the accidents caused because of uh, the carelessness or because due to exhaustion of human beings can be avoided so these are the major limitations of industrial robots organizations have to make huge investments to introduce robots at their work level places so ordinary like you know uh, small scale industries uh, uh, and even medium industry uh, medium scale industries cannot afford uh, advanced uh, robotic systems so organizations which are uh, huge like huge mncs transnationals they can afford robots in their work places that is one of the major limitation here since parts of the robot are made very precise their replacement is also very difficult and it will cost a lot so to program and set up the robotic system we need to have technical engineers professionals programming is not as simple as your cnc programming robotic program is bit different and we need to have professionals and maintaining professionals is a basically it uh, incurs huge amount of cost to the company unless the level of artificial intelligence is highly sophisticated robots may not be able to respond properly during times of emergency though we say robots possess uh, almost all the human like characteristics physical characteristics are fine but as far as mental characteristics are concerned a robot should have high amount of artificial intelligence if the artificial of the level of the artificial intelligence is lesser then robot will not you know respond quickly to an emergency for example if a employee is injured he cannot take uh, or if an employee is in danger in the workplace the robot cannot uh, take action on its own since the thinking ability is lesser why because the thinking ability increases when the artificial intelligence of the robot is higher but if at all a industry wants to procure a robot having high artificial intelligence then it will it is very very expensive it will it will be a cost to the company so these are the limitations of the industrial robots so these are the references of uh, uh, the videos which you have witnessed throughout the presentation so we have you know uh, thundershare.net then sky creative hd then we have uh, e for education sma.org these are some of the important uh, you know urls uh, by the help of which i have shared videos and through those videos uh, i hope most of you have understood many different difficult topics in this particular module 5 so with this uh, i come to the culmination of uh, module 5 we have uh, discussed uh, different types of machine tools like a lathe its operations then uh, we have discussed uh, milling machines its operations then you have seen uh, advanced manufacturing systems wherein you saw what exactly is a computer numerically controlled machine 
like a lead can be a cnc mission is a turning center or a milling center you saw the different features of it what are the advantages and limitations and uh, followed by what is a robot what is robotics you saw different types of links and joints what is a manipulator then what are robotic configurations the advantages and limitations of robotic systems so i hope mm-hmm. i have done justice i hope uh, uh, any student who watches these videos like you know lecture 1 session 1 to session 7 we have seven lectures or seven sessions spread about uh, mm-hmm. wherein every detail is covered uh, i strongly believe that all these sessions session 1 to session 7 on module 5 that is machine tools and advanced manufacturing systems will definitely help you out i thank all the viewers who are watching these videos for uh, uh, you know witnessing this videos and uh, you know gaining knowledge from my presentations thank you very much for watching all my videos